Laura, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I'm trying to uh, share my name to the host so you can go ahead and gear up your PowerPoint. Perfect. You see that okay? Yes. And let me just make an announcement real quick for everybody. If you could just please keep yourselves on mute throughout the presentation. Uh, so Laura can give her full uh, presentation. And then at the end, uh, you can unmute to ask any questions or you can ask them in the chat throughout the presentation. Okay. All right. Laura, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah. So I am Laura McDuffie. Um, I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the Migratory Bird Program, um, and I'm based in Anchorage. Um, and I just recently completed my master's degree, uh, which was focused on lesser yellow legs. Um, so yeah, I graduated this past spring from UAA, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to share um, some of the findings from my research, um, as well as just some stories from the field and some nice videography. So yeah, um, thanks for everybody attending on a Saturday evening. It's really nice here in Anchorage, at least. It's, it feels like it's actually summer still. All right, um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about a year in the life of lesser yellow legs. And this project would not have been possible without all these various um, collaborators from agencies, um, universities uh, from across the United States as well as Canada. There we go. So the lesser yellow legs is part of the Scolopacidae family, which includes the sandpipers, which is the yellow legs, um, as well as snipe, uh, turnstones as well as the curlews. And so the scientific name is Tringa flavipes, which basically means wading bird with yellow feet. So very descriptive. So Tringa comes from the ancient Greek word trungus, which is a thrush sized white rumped tail bobbing wading bird, which was first referred to um, by Aristotle actually. And so flavipes is broken down into um, the Latin of flavus, which means yellow, and then piece, which means foot. Um, and so fun fact, in the French language, the bird is actually called the petit chevalier, which means small knight. So since I'm giving a talk about yellow legs at a crane festival, I thought I'd compare the two for you guys. Um, so the lesser yellow legs is considered a medium-sized shorebird, um, whereas the sandhill crane is actually among Alaska's largest bird species. And so the average yellow legs comes in at a, just under 10 inches tall, whereas the sandhill crane is um, on average 47 inches tall or about 3.9 feet, which means that the sandhill crane is at almost five times the height of a lesser yellow legs. But when we look at body mass, the average weight of an adult yellow legs is about 0.18 pounds or 82 grams. And that's equivalent to about two nine volt batteries. Whereas the Sandhill Crane, its weight is equivalent to about 11 cans of soda or nine pounds, which means that the Sandhill Crane is 50 times heavier than the lesser yellow legs. So just give you a little overview um, of the, the yellow legs. They are a habitat generalist, at least on their breeding grounds. So they breed in the boreal forest biome. Um, so this includes open woodlands, as well as meadows and spruce bogs, as well as urbanized habitats. Um, and this is a species that nests on the ground, um, usually in some sort of depression. And so in Anchorage, Alaska, um, where, I've, where I've been working mostly, um, we find nests in a variety of different habitats. Um, so from nearly flooded tussocks to old recycling centers, as in this picture, there's a nest actually right here. It's a yellow legs nest, um, as well as power line clearings. We've actually had three different pairs nest in power line clearings, just like this one. Um, as well as different like soccer fields or meadows. Um, but they also do use less urbanized uh, habitats. So this is actually a yellow legs uh, here incubating a nest 
Um, and that's a really nice black spruce bog that that bird is nesting in. Um, so in Anchorage during the late 1990s, uh, Lee Tibbetts, who works for the USGS Alaska Science Center here in Anchorage, um, she did her master's on uh, lesser yellow eggs, and she actually described lesser yellow eggs that were nesting up on the hillside in Anchorage, and they were traveling with their chicks all the way down to the coastal refuge. So this is Potter Marsh, if you're familiar with, um, with that area in Anchorage, and then this is just the coastal refuge here. And so they actually bring their chicks across really busy roads as well as people's backyards and they have dogs and all that. So um, it was definitely um, quite a journey for, for these chicks. So lesser yellow eggs um, do have a really large range within Alaska and they're, real, they're commonly observed um, breeding within the, the Fairbanks area, the Tanana Valley area. Um, so some of the sites where many of these um, birds can be found um, are Creamers Field, as well as uh, Peat Ponds Wildlife Area, um, the UAF Trail System, and Smith Lake, Tanaw Lakes, and even uh, Lake Bee Terrace. And so each of these points are actually locations where lesser yellow lakes have been observed or um, recorded within eBird. And if you're not familiar with eBird, it's just basically a citizen science database where um, you can enter the birds that you've um, seen or heard. Um, so they are really common in the Tanana Valley, particularly from April through September. Although this time of year, um, basically from yeah mid-August through September, if there are any individuals around, they're pretty much all um, birds that were hatched this year, so young birds. Um, so on their non-breeding grounds, they are also habitat generalists. So they winter um, in a wide range of different areas. So from Southern North America to Central America, all the way down to Southern South America, as well as the Caribbean. Um, and they tend to use coastlines, um, lakes, a lot of floodplains, um, and agriculture and aquaculture as well. And this picture here is um, a flooded pasture in Guatemala um, in February of 2019, I believe. Um, so in terms of what they eat, uh, mostly aquatic and terrestrial invertebrates such as flies or snails and beetles and uh, dragonflies. They do love dragonflies. Um, occasionally you'll see them eating fish or grains and seeds. Um, but they do move pretty quickly when they're pursuing their prey. Here's a short video. Birds foraging. This is, was taken near Eielson Air Force Base. So now you understand a little bit about the basics of the species life history characteristics, um, but you may ask, uh, so that's all cool information, but why should I really care about lesser yellows at all? Well, it's because the species, although seemingly numerous, at least in Alaska, it's actually been experienced a very precipitous decline. And so nearly all shorebirds that breed in North America are experiencing some sort of population decline, but for the lesser yellow eggs, they've actually experienced a precipitous population decline between 63 to 70% uh, just since the 1970s. And so this information is based on uh, different North American breeding bird surveys, um, well, the, or, and, uh, as well as the North American shorebird surveys. And so in Alaska, uh, the annual decline in the northwest inter northwestern interior forest, which encompasses the majority of their nesting habitat uh, within Alaska, um, it's estimated that the decline is between 5.3 to 9.2 percent annually. And this is based again on um, the North American Breeding Birds surveys, which are road-based surveys, and then the Alaska Land Bird Monitoring surveys, which are um, more remote surveys that are uh, conducted in the state. <clears throat> so decades ago, the population was estimate, estimated at over a million birds, most likely. Um, but with this decline, today we see an estimate of about 660,000 individuals. Um, however, um, because of this precipitous decline, um, it's been suggested that this estimate likely should be revised downward to 400,000 individuals. 
current population estimate. So there's this avian conservation assessment database or ACAD, which was established by partners in flight. And it provides a conservation assessment and uh, ranking for all of North American uh, bird species. And so a species is ranked following a uh, this species prioritization matrix. Um, so it includes these three different conservation metrics. Um, so vulnerability that basically means if their species has high vulnerability, it's on some sort of watch list. So you might be familiar with the um, Audubon watch list. Um, decline. So if a species is considered to be in steep decline, it basically means that that population has uh, declined by greater than 50%. And then this metric called urgency, you can think of this as half-life. So it's basically how long into the future it will take a population to lose, lose an additional 50% of its population. And so for the lesser yellows, this is a high urgency um, because it's estimated that just within the next uh, 11 years, uh, the population will actually be reduced in size by about 58%. So we know that the species is in decline, but we really wanted to know like how and where geographically bottlenecks are occurring for the species. And so if you aren't familiar with this term of bottleneck, um, a population bottleneck or a genetic bottleneck is pretty much a, sh a really sharp reduction in the size of a population. And this is either due to environmental events um, such as famines, earthquakes, floods, fires, disease, um, or droughts even, um, or human activities, which um, is most likely the, the cause of the decline for this species in particular. Um, so some of the examples of potential threats for the species um, are climate change. So climate change and permafrost thawing um, can cause wetlands to dry. So this would be an example maybe in Alaska. Um, leaching of pesticides and different chemicals into ponds where yellow lakes forage. Um, so agrochemical exposure within the prairie pothole region of the uh, United States and, and southern Canada. Um, increased infrastructure along the Atlantic coastline, uh, reducing habitats, so that's urbanization along the eastern seaboard. Unregulated harvest of lesser yellow eggs for sport and subsistence hunting um, in the Guianas, uh, which if you aren't familiar with that term, that's Guyana, Suriname, and French Guiana, so those three countries. Um, and then lastly, uh, potentially harmful algae blooms. Um, produced from sewage as well as cattle manure runoff in the Pampas region of Argentina. Um, so Argentina actually has one of the largest cattle herds in Latin America with over 52 million head of cattle. Um, so this rangeland intensification um, and potential toxins from that uh, could be a potential cause of decline for this species. So how would scientists actually determine where these bottlenecks are occurring? Well, the best way to do that is to track birds. And so between 2018 and this year, 2021, um, me and my, my uh, collaborators and colleagues deployed 115 GPS transmitters on birds. Um, this is how we, we uh, deploy them at breeding sites and uh, migratory locations in North America, and then we're able to track them throughout the full uh, annual cycle. So uh, the study included birds tracked from seven geographically disparate breeding populations. Um, so Anchorage and Eielson, Canudi, Yellowknife, and Churchill, those were actually the only populations that we considered to be breeding populations. Whereas James Bay and Mingan here, we tag birds in those locations, but those were actually um, likely birds that were just stopping over or staging. Um, so they likely bred elsewhere uh, within Canada. And so the val this value next to each of these locations is the total number of birds that we sampled or deployed tags on um, in all those years. So 2018 through 2021 combined. So in total, again, we tracked 115 birds 
59 of those were females, 50 were males, and six were an unknown sex. So the first component of the actual field work, um, and the only way to really reach our objective was to try to search for a monitor nest so that we were able to locate where pairs are actually breeding, um, as well as trying to determine nest success. Um, so nest searching involved numerous hours. <laughs> it takes a lot of patience. Um, there are some nests that we found very quickly. I actually found one in five minutes this year, which is like unheard of. <laughs> So normally it takes two or more days, consecutive days, just sitting and watching birds behavior to try to find these nests. Um, so once we, once we actually found the nests, we monitor them with game cameras, um, as well as these little temperature loggers. Um, it's right here in between the, the eggs. You can see the, the cord coming out here. But that basically records the temperature um, so we can determine how often um, a bird is incubating that nest. And then I, like I mentioned, we have uh, game cameras. So here's a video of a yellow legs actually going in to um, incubate the nest. And you can see it's very um, uh, vegetated. So it, that's why it's so difficult to find these nests sometimes. All right, so once we found the nest um, and they were successful and the chicks hatched, we were then able to try to, to catch the adults so we could actually put the GPS tags on them. So we use different um, type, different methods. Um, we always use mist nets, but we use them in different um, setups. So um, this first here, you can see Zach and Callie are holding the net on either side and then just flip it up as the bird flies over and they're able to go get the bird out of the net. This um, next video, actually the, the poles are in the ground and we are playing a, a chick call on a Bluetooth speaker. And that chick call actually is attracting the adult towards the nest. So you'll see here. And so once they hit the net, we very quickly try to get over um, and get them out so there's as little stress as possible. Um, so once we catch the birds, uh, we band each individual with a USGS metal band, as well as a color band that corresponds to the actual study location. Um, so in Anchorage, this was a dark green. In Eielson, uh, this was yellow and Canute was dark blue. So all very different colors in Alaska. Um, we also put an engraved uh, leg flag on each bird. So this is dark green with white lettering. So it's a two letter code. And that's actually the only way we're able to identify birds to individuals. So we need to be able to read those letters. Um, and, in consecutive years in order to, to know who's returning. Um, so after banning, we took basic measurements um, such as tarsus length, which is the picture shown here, this is tarsus. Um, we took bill length, uh, wing length, as well as body mass. Um, and we also collected different uh, biological samples. So feather samples, uh, fecal samples, as well as blood samples. I actually used the blood samples to be able to uh, sex the adults that we caught because you can't tell the gender just by having them in your hand. Um, so then finally, before we let them go, that's when we put the GPS tag on. So we use this leg loop backpack method. You can see the picture here. The tag is just sitting on the bird's back. So you can basically think of as it as the shape of like a butterfly. So the body of the butterfly would be the tag and then the wings would be those leg loop. Um, so the harness material is actually like a really stretchy jewelry cord. And so it just slips over their leg and basically um, falls right into their, their hip socket and it just sits there. And so they're able to fly and walk and do everything they need to do um, without any pain. <laughs> so it works really well for this species. 
All right, so field work in general in the boreal forest can be a real challenge, um, even when I'm not working in remote areas. So uh, Jay Bear was our joint base Elmendorf Richardson, which is just north of downtown Anchorage. Um, it uh, isn't really that remote. Um, there's a lot of military operation areas that go on there, um, as well as some uh, actual like very large intact habitat. Uh, areas there. Um, but in, at Jay Bear in particular, flooding was a big issue. Um, so we had beavers that <laughs> came in one year and just caused water levels to rise super high. All of our nests were flooded. Um, this is actually a picture. This was all normally ground, just completely covered in water. Um, so we did have to canoe a lot of our sites, which actually was, was pretty nice. Um, it was, a, it, was, it was nice and relaxing first thing in the morning. Um, but with, yeah, with field work, there comes a lot of truck problems as well when you're working um, on in areas where there are roads or in some cases lack thereof really. Um, so definitely high center of the truck a lot, um, definitely get a lot of flat tires. Um, so there's actually a funny story with this one. So um, I was driving along in this pretty, um, this, this a gravel road that's pretty far north on Jay Bear. It's out basically in Eagle River. And I stopped uh, trying to, to fix the tire, trying to put the spare on. And I hear this yellow legs, like screaming, <laughs> calling in the distance and I'm watching it. And it actually like flies over the road opposite of where I was. And it was just calling and calling and calling. And it was pretty crazy because there's just, there was no water around at all. We were up on this really high kind of ridge. There's absolutely no wetlands around. So it just didn't make sense, but it's like, okay, after I finish uh, changing this tire, I'm going to go over there and check it out. And so we got the tire all fixed up, went over there and there was actually a nest right there on the opposite side from us, right on the edge of the road. And it was just the craziest thing. So if we hadn't gotten that flat tire, I never would have found that nest. So that was pretty, it was pretty funny. All right, and then there's a lot of mosquitoes as well. I know if you living in the interior, you know that there's a lot, but um, their buzzing can definitely make you go insane. <laughs> um, on Jay Bear, we also had a lot of black bears as well as some brown bears. Um, but they were very unafraid of people. They were definitely habituated to people. Um, so we had to be really careful. Um, I actually took the safety off my bear spray for the first time ever this year, um, just because some of these bears get a little too close for comfort. Um, and the bears don't only affect when we're doing surveys or monitoring nests, they also to prove to be a common source of nest predation. So this is actually a cinnamon black bear this year that uh, had a feast on one of our yellow legs nests. Um, but even with all those difficulties of being out in the field, it's like the it's the best part of my job. It's what I look forward to every year. And uh, I really love watching the bird behavior. And even the very vocal lesser yellow legs are quite intriguing. some more footage from Eielson Air Force Base. All right, so now I'm going to switch gears and dive in a little bit deeper into the actual movements of the yellow legs and what these GPS tags are actually telling us about these birds' movements. Um, so I'm going to focus on four individuals, um, one from Kanui, one from Anchorage, one from Churchill, and one from James Bay. Um, but this is actually an animation of all 115 individuals over the course of a full year. So you can kind of get an idea of where these birds are going during the non-breeding season. So they are spread out um, over quite a, a large distance. All right, so the first bird I'm going to talk about is PE, and it was banded at Canudi in 2019. 
And this is a male and he weighed 79 grams and he was a successful breeding adult. He had chicks with him when we captured him. Um, so in one year, he traveled 19,865 kilometers. And that was a single year. So he departed Kanuti National Wildlife Refuge on July 3rd of 2019 and arrived in Forestburg, Alberta on July 21st and stayed there through August 14th. So four weeks he stayed in that area. And then just four days later, he arrived in Cypress Quarters, Florida before crossing the Caribbean on um, September 1st, where he arrived in Ecuador on September 11th. Um, and he actually remained there all, all through winter until April 14th. So he was there for actually a full eight months. And then um, during spring migration, he arrived in Dean, Iowa on April 25th and was there for only five days before heading pretty much straight back to Canudi um, and arrived back on May 15th. So autumn migration took this for three months for spring migration only took one month. So with that whole distance, just in one month. So some of the potential threats that this bird is, is coming across. Um, so in Alberta, ag agriculture, coal mining, oil and gas production, those are all potential threats. Florida, agriculture as well as urbanization. Ecuador, lots of agriculture. Iowa, agriculture. Um, so habitat alteration and agrochemical exposure are definitely um, some threats that this bird likely faced during uh, just that one year. All right, so MP. MP was a female that was banded in Anchorage in 2019, and she weighed a whopping 98.6 grams. She has a very large yellow legs. Um, she traveled in one year, 27,374 kilometers, so quite a distance. So she departed Anchorage on June 26th of 2019 and arrived in Grand Prairie, Alberta on July 2nd and stayed there only through the 6th before moving on to North Dakota. Um, and, and she stayed there through July 26th. Uh, so then next, she went straight to Florida and remained there for two weeks um, before migrating over to Columbia. And so she remains there um, from about August 13th to the 31st um, before making a big jump down to Argentina, um, where she spent the majority of the non-breeding season. So from about September 6th uh, to May or April 1st. And so on the way back, unlike the other birds, she took a lot of really uh, short duration stops, only a day or two, and then arrived back in Anchorage by a May 11th of 2020. And so again, autumn migration took about three months and spring migration was uh, about a month and a half. And so again, the potential threats, very similar to this other bird, agriculture, gas, oil, gas production, urbanization, um, in Florida, he, she actually used this wildlife management area, so there's likely not as much, many threats potentially in that area, but agriculture and ranching. So again, habitat alteration, agrochemical, agrochemical exposure, um, as well as that toxicity and algal blooms in the, those ranching areas. So Churchill, A65, this was a male that was banded in Churchill in 2019 as well. Um, he weighed 82.9 grams and traveled 26,251 kilometers in a single year. And so he departed Churchill on July 29th and arrived um, in actually central Manitoba and stayed there through uh, August 18th. So um, a very short duration flight and then uh, basically staged there before moving super quickly and doing a full transatlantic oceanic flight over to Venezuela. And so he arrived there on August 26th um, and then continued on to actually the Amazon River in Brazil. And it's at the Amazon River from uh, September 5th through October 5th, so a full month um, before moving on to Argentina where then he spent the majority of the, the non-breeding period and remain there through May 3rd. Uh, and 
the way back, he took a short stop of about five days in Bolivia before making all the way back to Churchill um, by May 31st. Uh, so again, this bird took three months for autumn and one month for spring. And again, just like the other birds, ranching, um, agriculture are all potential threats. But interesting enough, this bird used a lot of these um, river floodplains, but there's not a lot of different um, human activity going on there. So um, yeah, different, different habitat types than the others. Okay, and then lastly, this is E4. Um, so E4 was banded in James Bay. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, this wasn't considered a breeding site, um, but rather like a staging site. Um, so he traveled 17,464 kilometers. And so he departed James Bay on August 19th and actually right away completed a transoceanic flight and arrived in, um, in Brazil by uh, August 25th. So it only took six days for this bird to go from James Bay all the way to Brazil. Um, and then on the way back um, in the spring, spent a couple days in French Guiana, um, and then a little bit longer stop in Haiti of about um, a week before moving on to Ontario. And so this actually appeared to be where the bird uh, nested. So um, that was some, some interesting information to have because we didn't know where those birds from James Bay were potentially nesting. So this bird, instead of taking three months for autumn migration, it only took six days, so very quickly. But again, spring migration was about a month long. And so this bird used a lot of um, natural areas or environmental protected areas, um, but also used um, agriculture. And so something different about this bird, it actually went to French Guiana where I talked about that, the harvest. So unregulated harvest as well as agrochemical exposure um, as for potential threats for the, that individual. So identifying where bottlenecks actually occur. Well, it's definitely easier said than done. So when you actually look beyond those single individuals and you consider the entire population, then that's when the patterns really begin to emerge. So these are all the track lines from all those different birds. So really the first step is try to explore these different regions where we're seeing a lot of birds kind of congregate. So everybody looks like they're going through the uh, prairie pothole region. There's a lot of individuals here in the Caribbean and the Guianas, as well as central Argentina. Um, so in the prairie potholes, there's actually a, a new graduate student that went down in July of this year for a couple weeks and did a little pilot study trying to, to catch some yellow legs as well as other shorebirds. Uh, to collect blood samples to actually be able to um, look at potential toxicity um, in their blood. Um, in terms of unregulated harvest, this is the main topic of my thesis. So I'm actually going to go into a little, little more in depth about that later. Um, and then Central Argentina, I actually am collaborating with some Argentine and Chilean uh, collaborators who are down there. Uh, surveying birds. So they're looking for birds that we potentially banded um, on their breeding grounds, but they're also trying to compare abundance across years and just see how the population is doing. All right, so like I mentioned, so the main topic of my thesis was unregulated harvest. And so it mostly occurs in the Caribbean, um, several different jurisdictions, countries, um, as well as the, the coastal Guiana. So again, Guy Guyana, Suriname, French Guiana are the three countries. And then um, coastal Brazil and northern Brazil. Um, so this table is an estimate of annual harvest values for shorebirds as well as lesser yellow legs um, for, for several different Caribbean um, and uh, South American jurisdictions. So it's important to note first that the majority of harvest occurs during autumn. So this is July through October. So just keep that in mind. Um, so this far right column here indicates the percent of lesser yellow eggs that are harvested um, within that total shorebird harvest estimate per jurisdiction. So, um, and this, this value here, so high or low is basically how confident we are in those estimates. So estimated annual harvest is based on hunter surveys 
um, and reporting, which includes log books and yeah, different surveys. So in areas where hunting is illegal, um, or even in some areas where it is legal, it actually can be really difficult to get a sense of take uh, because participation in these surveys is pretty low. Um, but it is clear even so that a harvest does occur. So it's really important to try to understand whether birds from certain breeding populations are disproportionately exposed to harvest, meaning are the anchorage birds more likely to go to harvest regions or are the Eastern Canada populations more likely to go there? Um, so I ran some different analyses and um, I'm gonna share some uh, figures here. Um, so this here is the proportion of birds from each of the breeding and post-breeding populations that occurred within an exposure area. Um, so you can think of this as west to east, kind of in this S pattern. So we have Anchorage, Canudi, Yellowknife, Churchill, James Bay, and Mingan. Eilson is not included here because we just put tags on those birds this past summer. Um, so my examination of this harvest exposure was actually only through October 21st. And that's because, again, the majority of harvest occurs during autumn, um, but also locations, we received less locations after October, October 21st, and that's because we scheduled the tags that way. They, you basically charge these tags and that's the whole battery they have. They're not solar powered at all. Um, so we tried to save some battery life so we could get locations all the way back to their breeding grounds again. Um, so what the results showed here is that populations originating in Eastern Canada actually had the highest proportion of exposure, um, but even birds that, that were um, originated as far west as Anchorage, we, we did see a small proportion of those individuals enter one or more of those different exposure zones. All right, so this figure here shows the probability of a randomly selected individual from each population occurring in any harvest exposure zone or outside of a zone. Um, so this is a binomial model with random effective individual. Um, so what I actually found is that the James Bay and Mingan population combined had the highest probability of occurrence from about mid-August through October, um, whereas the Anchorage and Canudi population had the lowest probability during that same time period. Uh, it's basically flatlined here along the bottom. Um, also, I did see some uh, difference, uh, temporal difference in peak occurrence. Um, so for example, here, the peak occurrence for Churchill was about mid-August, whereas for the combined James Bay and Mingan, it was um, end of August, early September. Um, and it's actually really under, uh, important to try to understand the timing of these birds within these different harvest zones um, because there are open and closed seasons in some areas. Um, so the risk of harvest really can fluctuate over time. Um, a good example of this is in Barbados. Um, there is an open season there that runs from the 15th of July to the 15th of October. So if a bird is there during that time, it would actually have a higher risk, you would think, of exposure than say if it was there in February when the season's closed. I love green crackers. Um, so this final figure here shows the probability of a randomly selected individual from each population um, occurring in each harvest exposure zone. So this is a series of uh, binomial models. And so what the results showed is that the Anchorage and Canudi population combined and the Yellowknife population, they all occurred within the Caribbean and Guyana zone, um, but not the Brazil zone, whereas Churchill was found in all three and the James Bay and Mingan population combined was only in the Guianas and Brazil. And so then again, the timing of the probable exposure really differs between these populations. Um, and so, yeah, again, timing is really important of when they are potentially in those areas. Yeah. Um, so fortunately, um, because I have a lot of strong collaborators, um, collaborations with biologists that are actually working in the Caribbean um, with some of these hunters, I was actually able to receive some shorebird harvest reports. And so in fall of 2020, I received two, um, two tagged birds that were harvested. So 02A from Yellowknife and A65 from Churchill. And if you remember um, back- I'll Pour it out a little bit, put some more milk in there. 
I actually uh, discussed. I can't take it if it's too hot because I'll spill it on myself. Hold okay. on one moment, Laura. Could everyone please mute your microphone? And then we will unmute in time for questions at the end. Thank you. Go ahead, Laura. Thank you. Um, so A65, I actually talked about this bird earlier, right? So it went all the way down to Argentina and back in uh, the, the year of 2019, 2020, but it was actually harvested in the fall of 2020. Um, so it's really interesting that both birds actually completed a full annual cycle prior to being harvested and neither bird were detected in the Caribbean in 2019. Um, where, where Guadalupe and Martinique are both located. So this kind of suggests that there may be some sort of variation in the pathways that birds use uh, between years, even for the same individual. And I can't really say why that might be. It's probably weather related or maybe food resources, um, but it is really interesting to see that variation. Um, and before I move on from harvest, I just wanna say I'm in no way like condoning the harvest of lesser yellow legs. It's actually, a cultural practice in these areas, um, but really it's the, we need to make sure that this harvest is sustainable. And so that's important for the stability of the species. All right, so some take home messages. So migratory routes are unique, yet potential threats are very similar. Um, so migration routes can fluctuate between years and even among the same individual. Um, but we are seeing that these birds tend to use the agricultural areas or ranch lands or um, yeah, areas like that. So very similar um, types of habitats. Um, lesser yell eggs do not observe political boundaries. So an individual lesser yell eggs can cover very long distances as you saw um, in a single year and it can move across dozens of different countries in its lifetime. And so the inclusion of social science, co-production and communication are really critical component, components in the development of conservation action plans. And this is just because long, uh, lesser yellow eggs are long distance migrants that occur in many different countries. And so it's, it, it's critical to try to devise some sort of conservation plan through the, the coordinated strategic and like deliberate effort of um, people from all these different countries. And of course, uh, awareness and education of the species decline and an understanding of the potential threats that they go through um, throughout the year, um, that understanding can really go a long way. So when people are aware of something, they definitely are more likely to take action in one way or another. Um, so this is a, a figure, I'm sure you've all seen this before, it's put together by Cornell of, Lab of Ornithology. Um, this came out after the, the Three Billion Birds paper um, that came out in 2019. So these are basically seven simple things that anybody can do. Um, so purchasing bird-friendly coffee, shade grown coffee, birds and beans is actually a great company, used them before. Um, participate in citizen science, so the Birds and Bogs program. It was uh, started by UAA and Audubon, uh, it, actually in Anchorage, and now it's expanded, I believe, to the Fairbanks area and Kramer's Field. So participate in some, some bird surveys. Um, I'm sure you've heard of these, putting decals on your windows to try to reduce bird strikes. Keep your cats inside or use a catio. This is a very fancy one. <laughs> um, you can use natural or, or uh, homemade insecticides if you need to use them at all. So some, something more, more natural. So again, really awareness and education can go a long way. So if you're doing something, maybe your neighbor, neighbor sees you doing that and maybe they will follow suit. All right, so I just like to end by stating that not everything related to yellow legs is all doom and gloom. <laughs> so there's definitely concern for the health of the yellow legs population. And there is um, some works um, to develop some sort of working group um, for the, conservation of these birds. Um, it's also been a very uh, a focal species for the new bird recovery initiative um, known as the Road to Recovery. So there are some actions taking place. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about reproductive success because I did mention that we do a lot of nest monitoring early on. And so um, it's definitely an important component of ensuring a healthy lesser yellow population. Uh, so this is actually a video of a of a chick from this year that we found that 
just hatched my nest. It was walking away. And you can see that they can hide <laughs> very easily. So you can easily step on them if you're not careful. Um, so here are some initial results from um, our nest monitoring. Uh, so, well, it's really important to note first that our sample size is not equal. Um, so in 2018, we found 11 nests, 2019, 15 nests, 2020, we found 21 nests, and 2021, we found 15 nests. But overall, we're seeing that the number of nests that were successful has increased over time. Um, the nests that do not succeed, that's either due to predation, like the black bear you saw in that video, or even abandonment. Sometimes they just abandon nests and you don't know why. All right, so I'm gonna end by just stating these are our different funding sources. Definitely could not have done uh, any of these studies without the help of uh, different, different organizations. Um, each of these GPS tags are very costly. So when you're putting out 115 of them, uh, it adds up for sure. Uh, so these are our various collaborators, and uh, I was able to go to Churchill in 2019 before the pandemic and actually help uh, catch some birds there. So um, it was great to, to be able to travel around, and I had a fantastic time working on this project. Uh, so yeah, I'd just like to say thank you, and my email is down here. Please feel free to email uh, any questions you might have if you think of them after tonight. Uh, so yeah, thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura. You could switch me back to being the host and then we can yeah. go on gallery view. Let's see, how did I do that again? <laughs> I think go down to participants and oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. All right, while uh, we're figuring that out, does anyone have any questions for Laura? You can always put them in the chat or you can unmute. We can ask one at a time and we'll ask questions for 15 minutes and we'll be done by eight. So if anyone has a question, go ahead. Yeah, this is Ed Murphy. Um, I'd just like to know if the human harvest in South America is just limited to those particular countries or there aren't data for other countries where um, like the Alaskan birds may be wintering? Yeah, so it does mostly occur in those areas. Um, so I believe Nicaragua is the one country not in that geographic area that does participate in harvest, but of lesser yellings, it's very minimal. It's basically nothing. Um, so yeah, those those countries I showed on that map, I know is really small, um, but yeah, it's just those those uh, those countries. And I believe um, I shared my thesis with Melanie. So if you're interested in getting a better look at that map, um, she can always share that with you, and you can read a little bit more about it. Yeah, I will make sure to share it along with the video once it's uploaded so everyone can look into her thesis. Any other questions? Carol Deal has a question. All right. All right. Uh, Carol wants to know, when the birds are migrating, do they fly as a group or do they fly singularly or just what do they do? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I don't know if we entirely know, um, but this species doesn't tend to flock up like maybe some other species. So they, um, we do see just individuals quite a bit. Um, so I expect that they, they probably fly in loose flocks, um, but not, but they're not like starlings. <laughs> they're not mm -hmm. gonna fly um, in very large flocks. And across the Atlantic, uh, who knows what they do. It'd be, it'd be pretty cool to put a little mini, mini camera on these birds and <laughs> actually see what's going on. Yeah. 
Would, would they fly nonstop across the open water like that? Yes, they do. They, they, they cannot land on waters. They fly straight across. Right. Yeah, Thank you. Crazy. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, I've got a question in regards to Alaska. Why did you choose Anchorage and Isleson? And uh, aren't there many other locations uh, in Alaska that uh, would have been as good, if not better? Yeah, there are many different locations. Um, it just so happened that a lot of our funding came through uh, Department of Defense. <laughs> so working on military installations um, was a good way to go. Um, in terms of Kanuti, uh, Chris Harwood is very excited about them. So he was uh, happy to collaborate um, and, and tag some birds up there. But yeah, I was in, it was basically um, where we have money, who's interested in helping us out and accessibility. So yeah, there, we definitely could have gone to many different locations as well. Anyone else? Or if anyone is uh, afraid to speak, you can also type your question in, in the chat. All right, this is Carol. I have a question. Yeah. Um, how, how, what's the uh, prospect for future research on these birds? How many more years will you be doing it? Yeah, so we're kind of winding down the migration portion of this. Um, we're going to continue to recite birds and try to get an idea of um, apparent adult survival. Um, we may still continue to monitor nests and search for nests as well. Um, uh, so I mentioned that there's the new graduate student that's um, starting some work down the prairie potholes. So we're gonna be supporting her um, with that work. Um, so the blood samples we collected on all these birds, we're actually using in a genoscape um, analysis. So we're trying to determine if these different breeding populations or post-breeding post populations are genetically unique at all, um, or if they're similar, like is there a potential that there could be a yellow leg subspecies? Um, so we're trying to figure that out. So there are definitely other components. Um, and, and now we have a lot of information, so we're trying to really um, figure out, yeah, where, where these bottlenecks are occurring and what we can do. We need to act now, now that we have all this information. Do the lesser yellow legs hang out with the greater yellow legs at all? <clears throat> at all? Yeah, they do. Um, yeah, if you're lucky, they will stand right next to each other and then you can easily tell the two species apart, <laughs> which is always really nice. Um, yeah, the greater yellow legs doesn't have as quite as large of a breeding range in Alaska as the lesser yellow legs. Um, I believe you don't generally see greaters up in the Tana Valley area quite as frequently. Um, but yeah, they do hang out together. Uh, I have a question here in the chat. Have you lost birds during the ocean crossing? How many? Um, so we have had tags that go offline. Um, so the great thing about these tags, I guess I didn't mention, um, is that I can actually go online and download all the data remotely. So I don't need to recapture the bird. Um, so I, I, get, I get new locations frequently. It's like Christmas morning, it's awesome. <laughs> Um, so some of these tags do go offline across the ocean. I can't tell you exactly how many off the top of my head. And it's, you don't know, you can't really say if they, if these birds died or if the battery failed or if the tag fell off. So you can't really say for sure if it's mortality or some other uh, issue going on. That's what the greatest threat would be as they cross track. You know, there's their greatest threat. What's their greatest threat? As they threat if they fly over they open fly water. Over what is their greatest threat as they fly over open water? Um, I would say having a fat reserves, first of all. Um, usually they're good about that, though, um, as well as different weather events. Uh, 
I did see one year a bird had to go way off course because of a hurricane. Um, so that's, if they have to change course and go way out of the way, they might not have the energy reserves to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. I just got a question in the chat. What proportions okay. of the Caribbean and Guyana's subsistence harvest do yellow legs comprise? Um, the vast majority. So they're the like number one harvest shorebird in those countries. Wow. Yes. Yeah, and you wouldn't think there's a lot of meat on them, but <laughs> they're considered a delicacy. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Any other questions? Are you in regular contact with scientists in South, in South America and other foreign lands? Yeah, so mostly um, I collaborate with different uh, Canadian agencies and they do a lot of work internationally. So it's kind of, I'm going through like third person, um, but I'm also, I also speak with um, individuals directly from those countries. I don't like personally know people that are actually hunting these birds, um, but we have a really good rapport between our collaborators. So we're able to, to speak to them. And so my hope is hopefully once COVID all chills out a little bit, I've actually been asked to go down to um, South America and give some presentations to, to uh, hunters down there as well. So a lot of different education and outreach. That's a, that's, a, that's a big component of this as well. Wonderful. Yeah. I have a question in the chat. How okay. are yellow legs harvested for subsistence? Um, so <clears throat> firearms as well as it's called uh, shocking shocking wires. So basically there is somebody holding a really thin wire and the flock of shorebirds is flying over the mud flats and they're whipping it really fast up and down. And it actually it sounds kind of brutal, but they're like beheading birds and taking off limbs. And so that's uh, that tends, yeah, that'll kill them. So brutal. Yeah. Wow. All right. <laughs> that's, that's just, yeah, that's their, their technique. And I mean, they've been doing that for a very long time, so. Okay. Any more questions? Going once. I had a certain attitude. Could I? Uh... Yeah. I saw two people pop up <laughs> who would like to ask a question. Going once. Nothing in the chat. Going twice. What altitude do, do they fly at? Altitude, I do not know. That is a great question. These tags we have don't have altitude, but some do. So uh, maybe we'll figure that out in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I, Thanks, I don't know if this is coming day. through, but uh, yeah. what, uh, what impact did you have with COVID? I don't know if you addressed that, but... Uh, uh, in, in regards to uh, COVID, uh, I, I know federal funding as well as state funding and so on was impacted. What, it, what did it do to you and your work? Yeah, so luckily funding wasn't actually the issue. It was more of being able to access areas. So luckily my study site was in Anchorage, so I was able to continue my work here um, but collaborators in Churchill, they were not allowed to go to Churchill, um, at least in summer of 2020. They were this year. Um, so we didn't get more tags out there. We didn't get re from birds. Um, so yeah, it wasn't really a funding issue as much of, as uh, accessibility. That's good. Yeah. That was uh, something that we experienced up here and 
in Fairbanks with uh, one of your colleagues uh, oh, okay. in regards to the goal and I. Uh, oh yeah. Nesting yeah. box studies. <laughs> so they had the same problem of not being able to get the researchers to move around or whatever. So uh, it's, uh, it's kind of sad, but uh, it happens. It does, yep. But I think you know, we all made the best of it and it all worked out. Yeah. All right, that is the last question what we're going to have. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Laura, for presenting your work and, and everything to the audience. And uh, we'll be in touch. And so I'm going to end the meeting now and I will try to make sure I put this video up uh, for those that weren't able to attend. All right. Thanks so, so much. Yeah, thank you. Everyone have a great night. Stay safe. Go find some birds. <laughs> thank hey. you.